Well, if you have a Bible, open it up and take it to the passage in Mark that was read earlier. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles on the round tables for you, and I want to invite you to go and grab one. As you are turning there, I want you um, just to consider uh, for a second um, the state of the church today. Uh, It seems that people are leaving the church in droves. The stats are pretty staggering. Uh, Between boomers all the way down to millennials and... And, and, and let's be honest, for many of us, we do wonder what, what impact can have the church have anyway. I think that one of the reasons why we feel that way is because at some fundamental level, the church has lost her identity her reason for being. And if you lose your reason for being, well, then what's the point? Archbishop William Temple is known for having said, the church is the only institution that exists primarily for the benefit of those that are not its members. The church is the only institution that exists primarily for the benefit of those that are not its members. But I wonder, if we're honest, if we actually feel that way. I don't think so, because I think most of the time when we make decisions about church, we think first and foremost about us, and not about them. But I think he's right. I think he's right because the church's identity is rooted in the identity of Israel, whose identity is rooted in the calling of Abraham, who was blessed to be a blessing, called to call, and elected for the sake and the life of the world. In you will all the families of the earth be blessed. And we are the children of Abraham. And therefore, I think Charles Spurgeon, the great 18th century preacher, was right, or 19th century preacher, was correct when he said that every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. And do you see yourself that way? When you think about your identity, who you are, how you would describe yourself to another person, would you say, I'm a missionary? Because if you are a Christian, that is who you are. Because you are a child of Abraham. And being part of Abraham's family means be a part of family, being a part of a family who is blessed to be a blessing, called to call, gathered to be scattered, elected, chosen for the life of the world. The word mission... Uh, it comes from the Latin missio, and it just means to send. And in this text in Mark, it's all about sending. As we look at it, let me pray for us. God, you have called us, and we are yours. Now have your way with us by your word. May it divide us up joint to marrow and place us on the altar that we might be a living sacrifice for you. For Christ's sake we ask it. Amen. Blessed to bless, called to call, gathered to be scattered, elected for the sake of the world. That movement is the movement that we see in Mark Chapter 6, verse 7, look, and he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. See, if Jesus calls us to him, he calls us to send us out. That's the whole point. And I wonder if you realize that. That if you've been called by Jesus, chosen by Jesus, loved by Jesus, you have been loved to love. 
You have been called to him to be sent out for him. And then Jesus, he sends the, he sends the disciples out with these curious instructions, verses 8 through 11. And he charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, they will not listen and will not listen to you. When you leave, shake the dust off your feet. And as a, I'm sorry, as a testimony against them. So Jesus gives them these instructions, which I would suggest not putting into practice this afternoon. Otherwise, you probably won't get invited to somebody else's house, and they will be very upset about, you know, you leaving the dust there. But really, like, the question is, is what do we have to what do these have to do with us? Are we supposed to copy these instructions? I mean, they're in the Bible. They're Jesus' instructions to his disciples. Are you his disciple? What are we supposed to do with this? Well, I don't think we're supposed to copy these instructions exactly. I think that these were given for a specific time in a specific place. And frankly, you should be skeptical about that. You probably aren't skeptical that I say that because you don't want to do that. And you say, well, that agrees with how I want to live my life, so okay, I'll agree with the preacher. You should not agree with the preacher because it's in the Bible and Jesus is sending them out. So I need to defend the claim that I'm making. And I would do so by pointing to somewhere like Luke 22:36, where Jesus recalls these instructions that he gave to the disciples. And then he says, remember when you did this, remember how I sent you out this way without these things. Now I'm sending you out in a different way. Now I want you to take different things. Now I want you to do different. Now I want you to stay in inns because they're going out into Gentile territories. See, the strategy changed. So this, these are given for a very specific time and place and purpose. And I think it would be wrong for us to try to copy them directly. But I also think it would be wrong for us to dismiss them as irrelevant. Because I think this passage is very relevant. Because all scripture is breathed out by God and given for our instruction, encouragement, reproof, correcting, training in life. And the number one way in which I think that this is relevant is that this text shows us that God's plan for the church and God's plan for us and his great invitation to us is that we would participate in his mission. I want you to look at verses 12 and 13. When we get to verses 12 and 13, and it talks about what the disciples did when they went out, it says, They proclaimed that the people should repent and cast out many demons and anoint with oil many who were uh, Sorry. And they proclaimed that people should repent and cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Now, why is that important? Because if you've been with this over and over in Mark, those are the exact ways that Mark summarizes Jesus' ministry. That's what Jesus has been doing. Mark 1, verse 34, And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak. Mark 1, 39, And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. You see, what the disciples did is exactly what Jesus was doing. In other words, the disciples are extending the mission of Jesus into the world. And that's a great privilege. That they get called to extend the mission of Jesus into the world. This is the point. This has been God's plan. That God's plan for salvation is not that salvation would come and end with you personally, individually. But that through you it would go to all the earth. That's God's purpose. That's why he called Abraham. That's why he constituted Israel. And that's why he reconstitutes Israel around himself with the 12 disciples. That's why he has a church. That's why you are still alive. As Christopher Wright says, the whole Bible renders to us the story of God's mission through God's people in their engagement with God's world for the sake of the whole of creation. And it's a great privilege that God used you and I 
when he doesn't have to use you and I to further his mission in the world? I mean, if he wanted, he could fill the earth with the knowledge and glory of himself by himself. But you see, he wants a relationship with us, union and communion. And he wants us to be taken up into his saving activity. And that's beautiful. That's a privilege. That's a grace. So what does it mean for us to participate in the mission of Jesus? Well, three things, I think, from this text. First, participating in the mission of Jesus means participating in the facets of Jesus' mission. This is the point of verses 12 and 13. And the first facet that we see is that they proclaim that people should repent, verse 12. Now, repentance does not mean so much um, just, you know, correcting your moral flaws like uh, bad habits and things like that. Uh, Repentance is a complete reorientation, a reorientation of one's life to the kingdom of God. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so what repentance calls us to do is to reorient our lives, to turn, to reorient our lives to the inbreaking kingdom of God and his rule. And that means all of our lives. Uh, that means our priorities. That means our loves. That means our desires. That means our hopes and our dreams. Uh, that means um, the way we think about our schedules. That means everything. Every aspect of our life is supposed to be reoriented to this reality that the kingdom is, in breaking, is breaking in. You know, a lot of people have been um, uh, in the midst of hurricanes this last month. We've got Harvey, and then we had Irma. And, and, you know, when those hurricanes were coming, the call was, I don't care what you're doing. You need to reorient your life to the fact that this hurricane is coming. Right? And if, if someone said, well, but I've got patients. The doctor said, I've got patients, and they're all stacked up tomorrow, and I need to go see them. They'd be like, no, 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 no. Well, yeah, but I got to get my driver's license renewed and I need to go into the DMV. No, 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 no. Your whole life needs to be reoriented to the fact that these hurricanes are coming. Well, God's kingdom is a hurricane that is launched upon this earth, turning things upside down according to Mark. And our lives have to be reoriented to it. I was at an art... um, show this weekend, and I got uh, into a conversation with a photographer there, and I was telling this um, gal, who was a photography teacher at Brooks, I was telling her how um, I used to do photography, but what happened was, is I really liked the darkroom, and when digital photography happened, I just kind of got left in the dark, (laughs) quite literally, and so, like, she was like, yes, that, was, that transition was really hard, and it happened so fast. But here's the thing. If you didn't jump on and learn, you're, you're lost. You're out of photography now. And that's me. Like, I still have, I, have, I, th- I thought this was really like, t- I, I have, you know, a camera where you put the film, that Advantex film or whatever that you could take out and put back in. Do you remember that stuff? I still have rolls of that, like, laying around our house today right? It's made it through seminary, through grad school, through post-grad. Like, it's still have that stuff, and it's good for nothing, and my camera's good for nothing, and I don't take pictures anymore except for really blurry ones on my iPhone because I'm too cheap to get the upgraded um, cover that, you know, has the whole camera in the, in the lens, right? I don't know how to take pictures anymore. I got lost. And she said, but if you jumped on, and it was quick. You had to do it. If you jumped on and you learned it, look at, look at what you can do now. There's a wave that swept, and you had to be ready for it. Well, the wave of the kingdom of God invaded this world in the first century. And there's an urgency here. You know, these instructions that they're talking about, no, uh, 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 like, have a staff in hand and sandals tied, but don't have a bag or money and these things. All scholars point out that these were the same instructions that were given to the children of Israel before the Exodus. That's what's going on. Mark is pointing out that here we have a new Exodus. And just like that Exodus, there's no time to to go back into the house and get your old photos. You got to be ready to go. 
there's an urgency. And so we have to actually go and proclaim to people to reorient them, their lives to the love of God and the rescue of God in Jesus Christ because if they miss it, they will miss it. And in order to do that, to tell others to repent, to reorient their lives, it means that we have to reorient our lives as well. And that's hard. I was talking to um, a friend once who was going to, considering uh, uh, LASIK surgery, going to have his eyes um, worked on. So he goes in, he's meeting with the surgeon, and the surgeon's uh, up very close, checking out his eyes. And you know how those uh, eye doctors can get. I mean, they're... They are right there. And he's, he's sitting there right there with the, with the eye doctor, and he's looking at him as he's looking at his eye, and he looks out and he goes, is that what I think I see? Is that really what I think? He has a contact lens. And I go, Doc, uh, th- my friend said, Doc, why do you have a contact lens? He goes, oh, I wouldn't do that surgery. Too risky. <laughs> You know, it's kind of hard to sell something if you haven't bought into it yourself. And it's kind of hard to proclaim the necessity of reorienting your life to the kingdom of God when you aren't seeking to do it yourself. When your life is still oriented to the upper middle class values of peace and safety and privacy. Which Francis Schaeffer said, as soon as the church adopted those, it would be its death. But isn't that what we value most of all? More than someone hearing the gospel and becoming converted? Isn't that what we value? Isn't that what I value? We have to reorient ourselves and we have to proclaim repentance. The second thing that that they do, verse 13, is they cast out many demons. Verse 7 says that Jesus gave them the authority to cast out unclean spirits. In verse 13, that's exactly what they do. Now, I know what many of you are thinking, at least those of you who haven't been here for a while. Demons today? What? How is this relevant? And who really believes in demons? But you need to know that in Mark, demons are simply a localized expression of the evil that exists all around. And you say, well, that didn't help me much. The evil that exists all around. I mean, you really believe in like evil and forces of evil all around? I know what some of you, you know, when I talk about this subject, I feel like um, the Avid Brothers and that song January Wedding, when they say, I hope that it don't sound insane when I say there's darkness all around us. I hope it doesn't sound insane, but I'm telling you there's darkness all around us. And you say, well, I'm not sure that I believe you. And I say, okay, did you lock your doors before you came in here? Did you lock your door to your house? Did you lock your door to your car? Why? Because the reality, how do you explain that? The need to do that if there's no such thing as evil in the world. See, G.K. Chesterton, he said that um, while the Christian doctrine of evil and depravity is the the one that people are most uh, repulsed by, he says it's the only one, the only core doctrine that can be improved empirically, that can be proved empirically. And I just did it. See, there is evil all around. And it instantiates itself in different forms, and we are called to participate in the mission of Jesus by fighting evil in every single way that it instantiates itself in our world. That's what we are called to do. That takes various forms. What does it look like today? I'll just mention a couple. I could go on and on, but we don't have all day. So let me just mention a couple prevalent ones. Pornography which people don't think is an evil, which is why it's so evil. It is an epidemic. The stats are staggering. Of internet users in the U.S., 40% use pornography once a month. 
Men ages 18 to 34, that number rises up to 70%. 10 to 20 billion dollars in the U.S. and 60 billion worldwide a year on pornography. That's more than all the professional sports combined. That's more than, that's three times as much as Google, Yahoo, and MSN combined. And here's the worst of it. 90% of 8 to 16 year olds have viewed pornography online. That means that the way that most of our children are first being exposed to the mystery, the mystery of sexual love, which is sacred because it points to the reality of Christ in the church and its share in the, tr the Trinitarian love of God. That mystery, that's being, that's being introduced to them. They're being introduced to that on some cell phone somewhere in a dark closet. And it's an assault. The reason why it's so wrong is because it is an assault. Whether you're married or not, it is an assault on the sacred institution of marriage. And it's evil. It's evil. And many of us in this room have been captured or are captured by it currently. And we have to resist it personally, and we have to resist it corporally. And we resist it by actually resisting uh, things that lead to it in every form. And we resist it actually by, we resist it by loving and honoring and cherishing the institution of marriage and all that it means. Of course, and, and by the way, it, it does have effects that play out in marriage. I mean, you know, it's no coincidence that uh, uses of drugs like Viagra and such are on the rise at the same time and correlates with pornography. Uh, libido is down. Pornography is up. It affects things. But it's not just pornography that assaults the sacred institution of marriage. There are other things as well. There are lots of other things as well, like um, easy divorce, no-fault divorce, which plagues the church just as much as it plagues those outside. These are evils that are pervasive in our culture. And it's not just things that assault the sacred institution of marriage. It's the things that assault the sanctity of life which happens across the board. It happens, with, uh, it happens with abortion. It happens with the laxity that the church has, um, the laxity that we have started to view uh, fertility treatments and contraception. It happens with, um, it happens with, uh, it happens with the racism and things like that that we see all around us. Those are sanctity of life issues. Those are image of God issues. And it's pervasive across our culture. And it's evil. And the church needs to fight it at every turn. Or, or then there's things like payday lending, which takes the most vulnerable in our society and puts them in crippling and enslaving debt you know, the Bible has a lot to say about debt, and certain debt is okay. But you can't give a loan with interest to the poor. That you cannot do. You're supposed to just give to them, and if you can't just give to them, then a loan is better. But a loan with interest to the poor is absolutely wrong. And you have to understand that at the heart of the story of salvation is liberation from the power of money and the power of debt over our lives. That's why the Lord's Prayer doesn't say forgive us our sins or our trespasses, but forgive us our debts. And he's actually talking about debt as we forgive our debtors. And that's why the Jubilee year was such a big deal. It's not an analogy. 
You're supposed to let people free of their debts. And the reason we can't do that is because we're enslaved to the God of money and materialism. And it's an evil. And it's pervasive. And we need to fight it in our own lives. And we need to fight it in the world at large. That's why, that's why we need Christians to go into government and law to fight these things to help. They proclaim that people should repent. They cast out demons. They resist evil, that is, at every turn. And then finally, they show compassion on the sick and suffering, and so are we. Look verse 13. And they anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. Malcolm Mudridge was a uh, famous journalist. He was also a secular humanist. He went down to India and he visited a leprosorium that was run by a gal that we know as Mother Teresa. When he went there, he realized that um, secular humanists usually don't give up everything to go serve in leprosoriums. And he became a Christian. You know, there's a reason why most hospitals around the country are not named things like Cottage, but things like Baptist and Methodist, and Presbyterian, and St. John's, and Mercy. Because Christians have always been at the forefront of caring for the sick and the suffering in this world. It is our call, and it's what extending the ministry of Jesus is all about. And so we need to do that. Did you know that Madagascar is one of the ten poorest countries on earth? And did you know that, that in Madagascar, 10 women a day die from complications in pregnancy and, chi- and, le- and uh, giving birth? 10 a day. If that weren't enough, 88% of their, forests, of their forests are gone. So this is a place where people are struggling to live off the land, but there is no vegetation. A place where people don't have the medical resources and they're dying all the time in pregnancy, like it's, you know, 1,500 years ago. And it's into this situation that Neil and Danielle Carlstorm went. Feeling called by God, they've been there planting trees and helping people understand how to live off the land and doing microfinance through that to help them and empower them. They started a maternity center which is saving lives. And they have also started worship centers and are calling people to reorient their lives from ancestral worship and the evil and slavery that that is to the worship of the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because of Jesus. Because they felt this call, because they want to extend his reign. I love their tagline. Reconciling people, health, and forests back to Christ. And we have to do that here as well, here in Santa Barbara. That's what we exist for. That's what we do every week in worship. We call people to reorient their lives back to God because throughout week, I don't know about you, but I get a lot of messages, a lot of messages about reality that are untrue. And I need to hear a call to worship so someone reorients me back to the reality of what God is doing in Jesus Christ. And we need to go out and tell people about Jesus. It's why we have Serve Santa Barbara too, so that we can care for those who are sick and suffering and the most vulnerable among us. It's also why we partner with Common Ground and with Immigrant Hope for those who are suffering and sick and poor to help. And it's a great privilege. Jesus extends his ministry through us. But you might say, Kyle, I have a hard enough time to get my kids to church on time. How am I supposed to do all of that? And that's a great question. I have that question as well. Where do we get the power? But I think that brings us to the second point, which is that participating in... uh, The mission of Jesus means participating in the power of Jesus' mission. Notice verse 7, Jesus gave them authority over the unclean spirits. 
And then in verse 13, they cast them out. Now, this is not a power that is inherent in the disciples. Jesus authorizes them, and then his authority works through them and is exercised through them. Because all ministry, all ministry is done in reliance upon Jesus and his power. All of it must be, uh, all, all ministry that is, that is done in, uh, for Jesus uh, must be done um, in his power and strength. And this has some implications. Uh, first, it means that we have to actually do ministry in Jesus' uh, way. You know, whenever um, Neve has a babysitter, we always remind her, Neve, um, this babysitter is your authority, right? We are delegating our authority to the babysitter, and we're saying, Neve, we want you, our daughter Neve, we want you to treat this baby, uh, this babysitter, like this babysitter is us when we're gone. But what if, what if we told that babysitter, listen, um, she's had enough shows for today. She's to eat her dinner, and then she's to read these books and then go to bed. And the babysitter said, oh, forget dinner, and um, we'll just watch shows all night, and I'm the authority, right? Well, that would be an abuse of authority because it's delegated. She, the babysitter, if Neve is supposed to respond to the babysitter as, we, uh, as she responds to us, then the babysitter must act in keeping with how we would act. And we, who have been commissioned by Jesus and authorized by Jesus, must minister as he would minister. And that's why the question, what would Jesus do or how would Jesus have us do this ministry, is not a secondary question. But it's primary. And that's why we need to search the scriptures to find out. Secondly, though, ministry has to be done in Jesus' name. If it's empowered by Jesus. Look verse 14. In verse 14, Jesus' name becomes known to Herod and other people because of their mission. And that means that they must have been doing things in Jesus' name and giving him credit for it. You know, there's a danger in participation in the mission of God, even though we're called to it. And here's the danger, that participation becomes possession. That we start to view participation as possession. See, it's, it's all right and good, and there's fine in one sense to say, this is my church. I know people that like correct people when they say that. Look, this is your church, and this is my church, insofar as we belong to it. We are a part of it. It is ours in that kind of sense. We participate in it. But it's easy for participation to become possession. My church, my ministry. And then we get jealous. And then we get upset. And then when rivalry hits. It, ministry must be done in Jesus' name and rely, if we're relying on his power. But it's also done in his power. While verses 8 through 10 are not directly applicable, I think they are indirectly applicable. I mean, when Jesus tells them to go out with nothing, it's so that they could rely on him for everything. Because we are reliant on him for everything, whether we realize it or not. And we have to remember that. And it's easy to forget. I mean, think about it. When you assess whether or not you should, God is calling you to something, it's all right and good and fine to say, what are my gifts? What are my capacities? What are my bandwidths? That's all right and good. But, 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 if you're only saying things, yes to things, that you think are, they, are, they are manageable and controllable by you, then you're probably not depending on Jesus for ministry. You're probably doing it in your own strength. If you're not willing to go out and be out of your debt in any way, shape, or form, you're probably relying on yourself. That's why, that's why last year was so good for me. Last year, about this time, uh, our staff got decimated to less than half. Um, that was because of, uh, that was because of um, circumstances beyond my control or the control of this church where God called people other places. Uh, but it meant that, that we got, you know, we had just as many if not more people and a lot less, a lot less staff, right? And, uh, and I don't know if you know this about me, but I'll just go ahead and tell you, like, I'm a perfectionist. Uh, I, I'm a massive perfectionist. And so 
it was very good for me. Um, and it was good for me because I had to realize that, you know what? When I don't have enough time and enough energy and I don't have enough heads and enough hands and I can't be in enough places, you know what? Jesus still holds the church. Jesus still loves the church. Jesus still ministers to the church. And it helped me to rely upon him to realize that, like, you know, if I've worked hard and I've worked my hardest, but if I get up and I don't have every single word of the sermon memorized and, uh, and executed to my liking, it is okay. It's okay. And if I can't make every call that I want to make or do everything that I want to do, it's okay. And sometimes God takes us into those places to remind us that that's how ministry always is, dependent upon him. Well, quickly, finally, I want to talk about how we don't just participate in the tactics of the mission and the power of Jesus' mission, but we also participate in Jesus' mission by participating in the outcomes of his mission. You know, Mark likes to do this literary technique where he inserts, he starts a story, and then it's like he has ADHD, and he asserts another story, and then he comes back to the story. At least he comes back. I often forget to do that. Um, But he actually does it not because he has ADHD, but because he's being very intentional. And he does it in this text, actually. He, He records the story of the sending of the 12 in verses 7 through 13, And they return, they don't return until verse 30. And in the middle, we have this long and detailed story about Herod and John the Baptist and how John the Baptist decapitates, or Herod decapitates John the Baptist. And you're like, why is this here? What is this doing here? Well, it's here because Mark is creating a sandwich and he wants us to realize something. He's wanting to interpret, uh, he's wanting us to interpret the disciples' mission in light of what happens to John the Baptist. And that's this, that John the Baptist's death cast a shadow, the shadow of the cross over all Christian mission and over the disciples' mission. And Mark wants us to realize that just as Jesus experienced hostility, so John experienced host- in Nazareth, so John experienced hostility. So the disciples will experience hostility as well. We, got a sen- we get a sense of this when he talks about how they need to shake off the, du- the dust off their feet when they're rejected. But Mark's point is that even in this, we are participating in the ministry of Jesus. I mean, just as John was handed over to the authorities and executed by a political ruler who was hesitant but caught in a dilemma, so Jesus was handed over to political authorities who were hesitant to crucify him, but caught in a dilemma. Uh, Just as John's death, in other words, John's death as the forerunner of the Messiah forecast the Messiah's death. And so we see this paradox. But even though there's a tremendous amount of power and authority given to the disciples, that power does not make them and operating through them, they're able to cast out demons, that power does not make them invulnerable because it did not make Jesus invulnerable. He was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquity. And so, we have to expect that if we're doing Jesus' ministry, we will receive the reactions that Jesus received. And one of those reactions is hostility. I don't think we expect that, but we should. But here's the good news. The good news is that the God who called and equipped Jesus and John and the disciples remains sovereign. The good news is that that God, that God has all power and all authority, even power and authority over death. And the good news is that he knows his own and he knows what is right and he will vindicate them and he will vindicate us as well. And the good news is that he is so powerful that he can even extend his mission in spite of the failure and the hostility because that's what happened with Jesus. 
He was put to death. And resurrection happened three days later. And what that means is that we have a God who finds a way out of no way, who turns failure into success. Because that's what happens to the disciples too, right? They do have success. In verses 12 and 13, they are successful. They actually go out and proclaim and people listen and they cast out demons and they're cast out and they heal the sick and they're healed. They actually have excess success. And you know what? We expect them to have success. We expect that they will be successful. Because, I mean, they're apostles and they're authorized by Jesus and his power is working in and through them. So, of course, they're going to go out and be successful. But you know what I don't think? I don't think that we expect that we will be successful when we participate in the mission of Jesus. Why? The same one, the same one who flung galaxies into existence and upholds them, who controls the tides and the titans of history, that one has called us to himself, united us to himself, and his power is at work in and through us. So why wouldn't we expect that if he was successful, then we would be too. Why wouldn't we expect that when we go out and proclaim the gospel to people, they will actually repent and believe? Why wouldn't we expect when we invite them into God's love that they will, we really will receive God's love? Why wouldn't we expect that when we go out and try to resist evil, that evil will be stayed? And why wouldn't we expect that when we go out to heal the sick, to comfort the suffering, that God will use all these things so that his kingdom will come, his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God wants his salvation to reach the ends of the earth. And he wants it to happen through you and me. That's plan A. There is no plan B. And so we should go out and the full knowledge that there will be hostility, but also expecting that, that when we do ministry in Jesus' name, as Jesus would have us do it, it will, there will be success. We need to expect that when we make relationships with our non-Christian friends and neighbors, that they will come to Jesus. We need to expect that when we exercise church discipline, that God will actually use that for his glory and the glory of people. We need to expect that when we do discipleship and training and equipping, people will be raised up for Jesus, that lives will change. We need to expect these things because we are participating in the ministry of Jesus and he will not fail. He will not fail. Amen.